number 85 was actually quite an unremarkable number until last year when Oxfam, an international charity, published a report in which there was a startling statistic that 85 of the richest people in the world have as much wealth as half of the world's poorest population. That is, as much wealth as 3.5 billion people. Now, this is what 85 looks like. We can visualize it. It's under the Dunbar number. 85 people would fit onto one double-decker bus in London. Now, I challenge you to visualize what 3.5 billion looks like. You cannot. We're not wired that way. And that is the best indication I know of systemic inequality. The systemic inequality in our world that is an existential threat for our species. No system can survive this level of inequality. So what happens if you are part of that 85? And you know that there are lots of people out there who probably are not living great lives and maybe want a little bit, at least, of what you have. Well, one of the things that you can do is you can build large, thick, very tall walls around you. That's probably a good thing to do, right, initially? Um, and then it's probably a good idea to also keep an eye on these people to make sure that they're not up to no good, yeah? Um, and maybe that's okay because a lot of us already live and subscribe to the psychosis, the mass psychosis, that there is an invisible, magical white guy that lives on a cloud that can see and hear everything that we can do. And we're okay with that, most of us, right? So it might be that we're okay with another, maybe less magical white guy who lives on a cloud who can see and hear everything that we do. Maybe we're okay with that, right? Um, and, uh, of course, the whole cloud itself is a lie, right? There is no cloud. There are only other people's computers. So let's think about it. We call them server farms. But what are they farming? What are we actually farming? If you think about it, companies like Google and Facebook, whose businesses are to learn as much about us as they can because that is what they sell to their actual customers, what they're farming is us. You are the product that we sell to our actual customers. You don't pay for these services, right? Or you get subsidized. So if we're in the business of selling people in Silicon Valley, uh, we had a name for the business of actually selling people's bodies, right, in the past. It was called slavery. I think we're at a point where we have to ask ourselves the very uncomfortable question of what do we call the business of selling everything else about you that makes you who you are apart from your body? And why, if this is our business, is this not being regulated? Because we regulate things, right? In the Industrial Revolution, when we started despoiling the environment on an unpresented, uh, unpresented scale, and we still do, at some point, we said, no, actually, we can't just cut down all the forests, even though it's good business, right? We make a lot of money because we're screwing ourselves over. So why aren't we regulating this, in, in Europe especially? Well, it's hard when the people who should be regulating, the very same people, like Neely Kreuss, who was vice president of the European Commission, uh, are acting like cheerleaders for Silicon Valley in her current position, for example, with the Netherlands government as cheerleader. And her successor, uh, Altinger, who uh, likens support for net neutrality. If you support net neutrality, you are like the Taliban. That's what he said, right? These are the people who should be protecting our rights, and instead they're acting like cheerleaders. Why? for Silicon Valley and big business? Well, because, ha-ha business, right? Good money, yeah. So we call them public-private partnerships, we call it multi-stakeholderism, we call it co-regulation, right? Inviting people to the table, we say, Google, how shall we regulate you on privacy? And they go, oh, we have some ideas on that, right? Um, 
But really what all of this is, let's call it by what it is, is institutional corruption. And it's getting worse. We have secret trade deals that are being negotiated right now, like TTIP and TPP. And what these trade deals do is they take power away from democracies and democratic institutions and give them to the hands of governments. There are clauses called investor state dispute settlement uh, clauses, which basically allow corporations to sue governments if they take any decision that harms them but benefits their citizens. Already Canada has paid over $200 million to corporations for taking decisions that were in the interest of its citizens but not in the interest of corporations. What we have is a war. It is a war on the public sphere. It is a war on the commons. It's a war on our human rights and our individual freedoms. But what it really comes down to is we're in the middle of a war on democracy. Because today, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say we no longer live in a democracy in many countries, and that we instead live in a corporatocracy. And the problem is the influence of corporate finance in public decision making. So that's the problem. If we leave it here, that's a very sad place to be. Thanks, Saral. We're really depressed this morning. Great, you did your job, right? What is the solution? The solution is really simple. It's stronger democracy. And there is reason for hope. There are places like Iceland, where the Pirate Party is the most popular party right now. That gives me a whole amount of hope that we can change things. But to do that, we need to get rid of institutional corruption. Because unless we do that, the financial incentives are too high and they're not in our interests as human beings. We need to, to do that, move beyond capitalism. Because today when we talk about capitalism, what we're actually talking about isn't free markets, isn't competition, we're talking about monopolies, right? We're talking about monopolies and we need to move beyond monopolies. Technology can be part of the problem, but we need to understand our relationship, our relationship to technology correctly. It's not this. We think of technology as a butler. There I am, there's my phone, and I tell the phone to do something, and the phone says, yes, sir, I'll do it for you, or, or you know, messes up usually, and, and that's fine, right? This is not our actual relationship today. Our relationship is much more like, oh, and if there is surveillance then, then it's signal capture of, of communication, which is not great, but it's not horrible. But this is our relationship. We extend ourselves with our devices. When I note something down on my phone, I'm actually extending my mind. I'm extending myself. And if that's the case, we have to start asking ourselves, where do we draw the boundary of the self? And in this age, I believe we have to draw the boundary so that it includes our technology. And if we do that, then anyone who's spying on us and surveilling us is not capturing messages. That is an assault on the self. And we already have a body of laws where we know how to deal with assaults on the self. Because today, we are cyborgs. We don't extend, our, we don't implant ourselves with technology, but we extend our capabilities using technology. So we should be extending person rights to the technologies that we're extending ourselves with. And that's where it becomes very clear that we ourselves should own and control our technology. So technology is not the problem itself either. As Melvin Kranzberg says, technology is neither good nor bad nor neutral. I see it as a multiplier, as an amplifier. You feed it bullshit, you will get orders of magnitude bullshit back. It's about time we started feeding it meaning instead. As Marshall McLuhan famously said, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. This is why it's so important that we don't just throw more of the same technology at the problem because that's not going to fix it. We need to fundamentally alter the character of our technologies. And that's where design comes into it. And I don't mean aesthetics when I talk about design. I mean holistic design, from the design of your organization all the way up. Today, in Silicon Valley, this is what we're doing in design. We're designing beautiful, gorgeous, empowering 
products that empower people in the here and now, but at the cost of ubiquitous surveillance, lack of ownership and control, which means that they erode people's freedoms and their human rights in the long term. This is not design. This is decoration. Decoration makes the status quo palatable. Design is what alters it. So today, we're building products that treat people like lab rats, like lab rats even, <laughs> to be studied, to be analyzed, right? In fact, there's a book called Hooked by Nir Eyal, which is very, very successful right now. It tells you how to create addictive experiences, right? How to build habit-forming products. There are only two industries in the world that call the people who use their products users. One is us, the other are drug dealers, right? And here's a book on how to build habit-forming products. According to its website, it is the book everyone in Silicon Valley is talking about. This is evil. Because design without ethics is manipulation. And we're good at that, technically. But that's what it is. So what is the alternative? We have free and open, right? Free and open source. But here's how we're doing design and free and open source. We're saying, hey, we're building products that protect your freedom and democracy, so use them. And what are they? What kind of experiences in the here and now? Well, pull requests are welcome, right? Yeah, sure, if you improve it, let us know. But we don't really care that much about that. So the cost is our experience. And our experiences matter. They're all we have in life. If we're having terrible experiences with, the, with our everyday things, these are the things that we spend increasing amounts of time with, we're having a bad hour, a bad week, a bad life. We cannot, it's arrogant to say, just because we protect your human rights, you must forego your immediate experience. We are, we are doing this because we think that as enthusiasts, we can build products for ourselves and that they will somehow magically trickle down and become usable solutions for people who just want everyday products to use. This is why we've been giving people personal computers for 30 years when apparently all they wanted were iPhones, right? This is trickle-down technology. And just like trickle-down economics, it does not work. Here's why. Because you might have two cars. Here's a car I drive to work every day. If it breaks down, it pisses me off, because the purpose of that car is to get me to work and back. That's it. I might have another car, a classic car that I love to work on. And if that breaks down, I am ecstatic. I am so happy, because it means I get to spend the weekend working on what I love. That's us in our role as enthusiasts. And we think we can design solutions for that role, and magically, they will also fulfill the requirements of the other role. And it does not. It's about experience. The companies that get experience, there are certain things that they have in common. They build everything. They control hardware, software, services, and connectivity. Because it's that combination that is the experience. One of these companies understands experience design. And you can see which one it is immediately. So what we need to do in the free and open world is to move beyond the next iteration, what I call independent technology. And we need ethical design to achieve that. With ethical design, we design products that empower you in the here and now and protect your human rights and democracy in the future. The cost, there has to be a cost. How about money? Or if it's in the common good, maybe we can pay for some of these with our taxes. But we can create sustainable businesses that do this as well. This is ethical design. And it means three things, respecting three things. One, we start by respecting human rights and democracy. Two, we build products that are functional and beautiful to respect the human effort that people put into using them. And then we don't stop there. We build products that are delightful, that are gorgeous, that respect the human experience. It's the three R's of ethical design, but it's really just one R. It comes down to respecting human beings. And this is where we're failing. We're building products that don't respect human rights. And when we do that, we're not building products for people. We're building products on the backs of people. And that is dark design. And those are the products that we have today. To fix this, we have to move beyond the clouds. We have to move beyond network topologies that, are sent, that have centers, like the web. 
every center on the web, in pa if there are economies of scale, grows, and then it becomes the monopolies that we have today. We have to remove those centers. And it's not just Google, Facebook, and Twitter. We've, we're at a sharing festival, right? It's Uber, Airbnb, and couch surfing. You're not doing anything differently unless you change the power structures at the heart of this, right? You are just doing a lot of PR and making yourselves feel good with some uh, you know, new age uh, yoga uh, exercises. But we're not changing the power uh, actual relationships there. You know, we're talking about excess capacity. How do we, what do we do with excess capacity? Why aren't we asking ourselves, why does that excess capacity exist in the hands of a few people to begin with? Maybe that's the relationship that we need to fix. So the future will be distributed. The future must be egalitarian in its topology. It must be a distributed topology like this, where every node is equal and interconnected. That is the sustainable topology. So where Facebook says, to share a photo, you must share it with me also, we say no. To share a photo, share it directly with your friend. That is independent technology. That is the next iteration of free and open source. We must be independently funded. No venture capital. We must be sustainable. We must be designed for the whole term. And we must build things that are distributed in topology. They must be free as in freedom, so people don't have to trust us and we can protect the commons. And they must be made by diverse teams designing for themselves. Because otherwise, if we're designing for the other, that's colonialistic design. That's colonialism. We must build teams, because we can only design for ourselves. And I can only be a young, middle-aged, white guy. And I can only design for myself. I can't change that. I can only best design for myself. What I can change is I can make my team as diverse as possible, thereby by designing for ourselves, we will be designing for a diverse audience. And that is how we win this war. Diversity is not you doing anyone any, uh, any favors apart from yourselves. So we have a manifesto. Please read it about independent technology. What we need to do is we need to move beyond centralization, move beyond venture capital, Move beyond worshipping the Silicon Valley model, because that is the myopic, toxic model at the heart of the problems that we have today. We need to move beyond that colonialistic, the colonialism at the heart of it. We need to move beyond a privileged world, where a very tiny few have privilege over others. We need to move beyond inequality. We need to move beyond bullshit. Because here's what we've done, people. Here's what we've done. We've planted a bullshit seed. <laughs> and we got a bullshit tree, OK? And then we climbed up into the branches. And now we're wondering why the fruit tastes like bullshit. <laughs> and there's a reason for that. That's the only type of fruit you can get from a bullshit tree, is a bullshit fruit, right? And those of us who benefit from this system, think that if we decorate the tree, that's going to mask the taste of the fruit. But it does not. And some of us who see the problem are saying, maybe if we prune the tree, we'll change the nature of it. But pruning a tree does not change the nature of a tree. So here's what I think we should do. I think we should get down from this tree, some of us, walk a few steps to one side, and plant a new seed, a seed based on equality, human rights, democracy, diversity, and sustainability. And then we'll get a very different type of tree. And we won't have to decorate it, because it will already be beautiful when it's based on these principles. And the fruits that we get will be diverse. And then this is really important. We build a bridge from one tree to the other to make it as easy and convenient as possible for people to join us on our tree. Because that is the bridge between the centralized world of old and the distributed world that we must create. A world based on reason. A world based on human rights. A world based on democracy. A world based on, 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 on democracy. This is the world that I want to live in. This is the world that I believe we deserve. And this is the world that I challenge you to build. Thank you.
Thank you.